the work on you know your brand strategy uh your intentions your values really do matter because that's the thing that makes you distinct from other businesses Hi, I'm Neil Perkin, the host of Think With Google Firestarters. And Firestarters is a series of insightful conversations with the interested and interesting of the marketing, advertising, and innovation communities. And today I'm speaking with Andy Cowles. Um, Andy is an international design consultant specializing in brand identities, which are powered by content. So his leadership roles have included uh, creative director of uh, Time Inc UK and creative director also of Mademoiselle and Rolling Stone magazines based in uh, New York. And he's the winner of the British uh, Society of Magazine Editors Mark Box Award for Lifetime Achievement in the publishing industry as well. He's a renowned thinker and doer in the visual presentation of ideas and uh, content. So. Andy, welcome to Firestarters. Uh, so as I always do, I'd like to begin with uh, asking, what is your provocation for the Firestarters audience? Uh, thank you very much, Neil. And uh, thanks very much for inviting me on your show. Uh, very flattered to be here. So yes, my provocation, obviously I have many of those, but what I would like to say is this. Design. Design is the most misunderstood term ever. People think it's some kind of visual outcome. It's not. It's the process behind those outcomes. It's a verb and it's not a noun. Now, I can go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's uh, plenty to dive into there. Um, so I, I love this idea that you just said there about how design is uh, like a process, not an outcome. And um, so really the theme of, of today's conversation is very much about the presentation of ideas and, and sort of visual inputs if you like and how you you communicate ideas so tell me a bit about this idea of uh, process not outcome what do you actually mean by that what i mean is that um, the visual outcomes which are are, are are part of our comms come in many different forms you know there is the there's typography there's art direction there's there's the color palette um there, there's a whole series of, of bits which are bolted together if you like which create a single instantaneous moment if you like in the mind of the person who's looking at it and that is what we're looking for we're looking to persuade people in three seconds or less if you like and because we are we are visual people you know we we often talk colloquially about oh well, i heard this thing or somebody told me about this thing or i've read this or i've read that but until we see it with our own eyes we never believe it so we're hardwired to accept uh truth if you like as communicated visually and because we work on that sort of left brain right brain business it happens in seconds and so therefore when i'm talking about design i'm talking about how we engineer uh, a position or a piece of professional communications visually in order to achieve the most optimal outcome in the space of less than three seconds. Now, there are you know, components to that, but that's much like saying, well, there are sort of components to soup, <laughs> but it's still soup. Does the soup taste good? <laughs> and so I've always, I, I consider design to be the process by which we decide how we're going to kind of engineer this if you if you like and so it's this is why i believe the term is misunderstood because yes it's strategy but it's also execution and napoleon taught us that execution is everything harvard will tell us that you know most people have actually pretty good strategy most people do and also most people's strategies fail and that's because they fail through bad execution in other words bad design so tell me a bit more about, uh, I'm going to draw a parallel here because I obviously have huge experience of um, design sort of from print formats. Uh, I'm taking the example of like a magazine front cover, for example. There you've got to actually put in a lot of ideas, content in a, a visually appealing way that really connects with the audience, right? So, so you've just got a single page in which to do that. So tell me a bit about the kind of lessons of how you do that well um, and what sort of learnings we can get from that when we're thinking about presenting ideas. A magazine front cover is just a curiosity, if you like, because it has to both be always the same and always different. And so what you're doing is you're building a container into which the content will go and that content is going to change all the time. 
but it's also a moment in time it's like in a football match it's like where you put your foot on the ball um because a magazine front cover has to you know it's it's a static item now you have to optimize it obviously for its distribution and so you know obviously the news agents that's a terrible place to do business uh but we now do our business on on the mobile phone and so for you you can mobilize you, you you can optimize for that but the idea is that you're going to create a brand identity a media brand identity which is a fixture and a fitting and then the content bounces off that and is informed by that if you like so it's <clears throat> it's a very dynamic uh relationship between you know absolutely rock solid consistent brand communication and essentially content uh and content is uh is is the fuel if you like which powers successful brand identities is the way in which we sort of by constantly sort of sharing our point of view if you like with our, with our audiences we can sort of build affinity uh with a discrete group of people regardless of whether they want to buy our product or not because what it means is that when they do come to the point where they might want to consider widget a or widget b well they're going to choose widget a because they've already got a relationship with us so so a magazine front cover, a legitimate 20th century art form, truly. Um, obviously, it's the distribution model that's kind of wrecked the way we think about magazine front covers now. But they're still incredibly potent, high-value assets. And I think it's, it's a really interesting way that you I've, I've seen you sort of phrase it before, which is about if you think about the magazine cover again is quite a good example of this i think because you're talking there about the sort of consistency of brand and uh, but also how you present the ideas on the cover and in a way that sort of grabs attention because you've got that kind of few seconds in which to grab attention but there's also the thought uh, i think you talked about the idea of of they're just really understanding your audience and so it reflects their identity as well so tell me a bit about that Oh, absolutely. You you are so, so right. I mean, this is all a magazine front cover has to do. It reflects back uh, to to the person who's staring at it, looking at it, who snatches at it, uh, a sense of who they are and who they might be. And that informs all the design decisions. So, for example, I mean, two examples. Um, I'm a subscriber to The New Yorker. Beautiful masthead, you know, you know, glorious piece of topography. Uh, and there's always a, an illustration on there. It's not a photograph and there are no cover lines. And so the conceit there is it kind of, if I look at that, I'm imagining that I'm the kind of urbane, you know, sophisticated, uh, very worldly wise, international person that I am, which obviously is a tiny shard of my actual true personality, but it illuminates and burnishes that. And so when I, when I see that reflected back at me, I'm thinking, well, this is who I am, clearly, and therefore it's worth the money. Equally, you look at the cover of Private Eye, which is a, a, a brilliant cover design, you know, and, and what that reflects back to me is the, another aspect of my personality, which is that sort of like understated, satirical, British kind of, um, you know, I'm, I'm funnier than you kind of moment, if you like. Uh, and so the design in every respect of those two front covers is informed by the feelings that we want to generate inside the heart and the mind of the person who's looking at it and that goes down to the nature of the logo the stock whether there are cover lines or whether there are not um every aspect of it and, and so if we were to draw a parallel um between that idea of sort of um presenting ideas and grabbing attention and connecting with the audience uh, from a magazine cover into a, like a pitch deck or or a presentation, what would be your advice about how uh, strategies planners, anyone presenting ideas, uh, can bring that thinking into into a, a pitch deck to be persuasive? It's a brilliant question, and uh, in my business now, I spend a lot of time uh, with pitch decks. Uh, along with my colleague Andy, we run a Guardian Masterclass called Never Lose Another Pitch, and we did it. We've done it for years, if you like. I mean, there are two things to say. First of all, pitches are won and lost before you get in the room most of the time. Uh, and so therefore, what we're really talking about is uh, the pitch deck is a sort of a, a crystallization of what people already think and feel about you. It's really helpful exercise to make a pitch deck. Um, but it's the again, it's the process. I made a pitch deck with my friend Larry in New York City, and he was, he was pitching to Pandora, and we did a load of work. It was for a podcast. And... Uh, Obviously, he made the pitch. Um, I wasn't there, and I spoke to him afterwards. Oh, Larry, how did it go? And he said, it went fantastic. And I said, uh, how did the deck go down? He said, I don't know. I never showed it. 
because you didn't need to show it because we'd worked through the story in the act of making it however that said the first page of your pitch deck is like a magazine front cover or any other you know piece of communication it's it it's a moment in time and people you can win or lose on slide one so invariably there's going to be a brand mark you need to say who who you are in some form in some way and then you need to encapsulate why people should continue to pay attention and so the headline is is critical you can't put the title of the pitch deck as the headline that's that's not of anyone's concern and so you know you got you got three three opportunities one is you need to say who you are the second is you need to make a really good promise and then you need to combine those two things in a way that people will believe that you can keep that promise and so that's where you are dealing with you know it is an artistic venture it's just like well are you going to put a picture on there are you going to make it a color and if so what color are you going to choose a typeface well clearly you'll have to or are you going to handwrite it you know what's the story how do you want to connect to engage with your with with, with your customer i want to pitch once uh, with a client whereby my, i made the opening slide red because i knew that their existing branding was red and i knew that the, and when i went into the room after the previous agency they put their color on the screen and so i saw their slides departing and they were all green you want to align yeah that's so interesting and and i guess um another thing to think about here is a combination of like uh, visuals and, and text you know, because we have extremes don't we? some people like to be very visual just have a picture on the screen or on a slide other people you know might sort of populate their slides with loads of bullet points or whatever so how do you communicate ideas uh effectively using a combination of visuals and text you you can't separate the two things it's like it's like eggs in an omelet right uh and you know the beauty of working with words and pictures is that you will each will bring the other to life if you like you can create a whole new idea out of kind of raw material um but at the end of the day you know short sentences strong words you know this is what this is about how you know politics has devolved to that uh you know but the best news headlines you know re are reduced to that so invariably you know three word headlines so you've got to be short you've got to be strong uh and you've got to be clear um but it does depend on on, on the message you're trying to communicate because sometimes you actually do want a lot of content on the slide sometimes you do want to kind of let people understand that you know you're across the detail it doesn't mean that people are going to read it all necessarily and again also with pitch decks i mean uh, and and this is an aside but is this is this a static moment or is a is, is, is this a theatrical presentation because if you want to get a lot of content on the slide obviously you're going to go through it dagger 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 um but it's it, it, invariably it's always going to be less words are more powerful and invariably the opportunity to place a photograph can help but it's got to be the right picture you don't want to if you know you don't want to put something that's completely inappropriate you do not want to put something on a slide which people can think what the hell does that mean um you know you can you can bend your story out of shape instantly with the wrong kind of photograph in which case don't put a photograph there so it, it, there are no hard hard and fast rules but it does depend always about what's the what's what's the goal here you know who who are we trying to persuade and what's the best tool to do that job so so let's talk about um uh, aesthetics and you know how you sort of can use aesthetics to persuade i guess there was one quote i want to quote back at you if i if i may so um you've talked a bit about um, aesthetics is uh, loosely defined as an appreciation of something beautiful so in art it's the artist who decides what's beautiful but the interesting uh, thing i saw you say is that is that in commercial art you're looking for a measurable action a business transaction and the audience is predetermined so the the aesthetics or the visual outcomes that you're looking for have to be perfectly tuned not just to the content but also to the customer and their needs 
Yes. So tell me a bit more about how you tune the aesthetics to the customer and their needs. What are you actually talking about there? If you're uh, if you're a brand that's making art, then obviously you can prosecute your own agenda. So if you are Vogue, right, you've got to create art. Otherwise, you won't have authority in the space in which you claim to be. And so therefore, it's entirely appropriate to produce stuff which if people don't like it well tough you know you're vogue and therefore it's that, that's your job and your duty to kind of move the line out if you're a, a painter again you know you're going to produce your uh your reaction to the, your your own humanity the events of the world whatever and uh, and if people don't like it well you're going to find other people who uh, perhaps will like it commercial art is different because we have to uh, un understand you know the specific needs of uh, of the people we're trying to communicate with and so empathizing with them you know trying to understand you know what is their pain point what is their you know what's their vanity uh what what uh what's going to kind of encourage them to sort of imagine themselves in the best possible light uh is really really important and so when we are thinking about aesthetics if you like and and what is beauty what we want is for the the, the subject to really see a version of themselves there's a narcissism in here if you like if i look at an apple product obviously it's beautiful uh, and i see that reflected back and so therefore i go i'm beautiful it's um it it, it, it sounds a bit kind of high-minded <laughs> But I do think that there's some there's some truth in this is that is that we need to you know try and try and touch people in a way where they really do truly feel like they're the best version of themselves, and sometimes that can mean using uh, a, a sort of an existing trope or a conventional set of uh, visual considerations that people do consider to be beautiful. But it's like architecture; it's just like you know some enormous concrete brutalist slab stuck up in the middle of russia uh might be considered by some to be beautiful equally someone might enjoy some really sort of light kind of victorian filigree you know it's uh there's, there's beauty everywhere but what it has to be is aligned to the specific idea of how people consider themselves in truth in, in, either in reality or in their fantasy and most people live a fantasy life anyway so it's invariably up here that you're trying to connect with does yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's quite a lot to hold on to <laughs> yeah and and i guess the thing that i'm thinking of here is is in your enormous experience uh working on such a broad range of magazines you know from like you take rolling stone and then like country life you know you've got such kind of diverse audiences there uh, and such diverse aesthetics as well. So, so how do you actually connect with the audience in order to understand what will work for those very different audiences? Good question. And yeah, you're right. I mean, it is from fashion to fishing and all points in between. You know, I can work on, you know, you know, with good people and contagious on the world's most expensive magazine in one moment. And I'm doing fishing news for a bunch of, you know, really grumpy trawlermen out of Fraserburg, you know, on tabloid. You know, I mean, it's a rare opportunity and I was pleased to have it um, because who, whoever gets to design a newspaper in this day and age. When you're dealing with a magazine is, is an unusual thing in this day and age because it's paper. And so therefore you're dealing with reflected light, not transmitted light. That's good, though, um, because it does. There is a different quality to things that are in the real world and how we see things reflected back to us. As we move around the paper, the light changes. I can move around the screen and the light won't change. So therefore, if I move, if, if I'm looking at a piece of paper, you know, it, it, it alters. And so it's a kind of reflection of my own humanity, if you like. But in the first instance, you, you've just got to respect the format. Legibility, can you read it? Is it possible to read this? And can you read it with ease? That really matters because reading is hard work. Most people will do anything they, they can to avoid reading it. Now, sometimes you want to manage the legibility in a way which kind of uh, reflects the, the audience's idea of themselves. There was a you know, fantastic campaign for British Airways uh, not so very long ago. A huge, great big white billboard with a tiny little piece of type and little kind of radio buttons that you toggle. Uh, 
you know, I'm going on a stag night, pray for me, or, or I can't remember what the comms were, but it was designed in a way that was not yelling. It was very, very quiet. And I really respected that because I thought this is how the audience considered themselves to be. It's not like, you know, buy this widget tomorrow. But with, with print, there are there are certain there are certain ground rules. You've got to stay in the white lines. So, you know, you've got to stay in the edge of the paper. You know, you can't, there are there are basic rules to topography and you cannot break them unless, of course, you're David Carson and you want to write a 3,000 word article in presenting dingbats as an art form. But, you know, my clients, were, I think, would push back on that. It's not going to play very well in, you know, <laughs> amateur gardening. So, so you, you always start with a contract. And the contract is the size of the type versus the size of the paper. How many words will fit into this particular piece of space? You know, it's it's confined. And the rigor of that is, I think, really helpful. You know, you're not confined in a digital space. In a print space, you are. X number of pages, X size. And therefore, what's the relationship of the number of words, the size of the words to the size of the paper? And you start there. Uh, and, and that's the foundation of everything. So when I'm designing the magazine, the first thing I will do is I will I will set the top the body type, the basic type. So if it's going to be nine points or if it's going to be ten points, yeah, you know, it makes a profound difference. Then you can start writing contracts with uh, with writers about how many words they're going to cough up. Yeah, I, th I think um, it, as um, as you're speaking now, I think it's so interesting just to think about. Um, the differences as well as the similarities i guess between how you present ideas in print and digitally so your point there about um how the constraints of print lead you in a certain direction um so what happens when you're trying to represent rolling stone or country life or, or whatever in in a digital format how, how do you do that in a way that actually carries the same rules or what rules you you bend or you change in order to really make that work in a digital environment a mobile phone is, is is a tiny little hole, right? So it's a very, very small aperture. And that's why a lot of people's branding has kind of flattened out, if you like. Some of the more esoteric logos that you've seen, you know, particularly for fashion brands and everything, are all being reduced to things that work on a mobile device. And so Sans typeface has become incredibly popular because obviously there's no extraneous detail. And so people do, uh, you know, understandably, you know, gravitate to, to, towards the most optimal uh, presentation for, for a mobile device. And sans fonts do work, work well there. The risk is, of course, everything flattens out, everything looks the same. Um, and so therefore, uh, what you're, that, which is which is why you know, the aesthetics and the sort of the, the design strategy of the, of the marks that you choose to make become even more important because you've got so much less to work with. Now, the New Yorker, for example, you know, I'm a fan of that brand. The way they've transitioned to mobile is, you know, it's beautiful. You know, their typeface is, it is a serif. Um, you know, it's a really considered serif. I think it's probably Garamond or something fancy. Uh, but it's set in a really good size. It's 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 easy to read. You can read, to, I can read 10,000 words on, on the mobile phone if, if it's something I'm interested in. Uh, it's well set. It's well formatted. Uh, economist is also very good in this regard. You know, the text is broken up into very, very easy digestible pieces, you know, short. And so I think that, again, it's come back to the, the, the tension in the pieces. You've got to make yourself completely distinct. You've got to make sure it, people understand this is your point of view and that you own it. And it's not some sort of random person on the internet is banging on. So people need to know that this is your this is your voice and that's why on a on a mobile phone you know if you're if you're trying to share words then you know the, the fine control of the topography really really matters and it's, you've got to you know blend that kind of brand perspective with 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 a ruthless approach to legibility so what about um you touched there on kind of logos brand identity and um uh, and are there certain types of logos or uh, maybe I'm going to pick out an example actually because I, I know you've talked before about how brilliant the NHS logo is right so let's take that as an example and maybe some others but what what's good about something like that as an identity uh, in the way that it works 
Well, I think you know, logo is the top of a branding tree, if you like. You know, it's the it, it's the absolute apex of the triangle. And when you're really building a logo, you're actually building a whole design language, if you like. And it's just one aspect of it. It sort of crystallizes it. But but yes, I mean, there, there, there was that great uh, uh, um, whole load of yelling on the internet recently about um, WH Smith uh, changed their logo to something that looked like the NHS logo and everyone got very upset even though it appeared on about sort of four shops in Leamington Spa uh, but for those who have not seen it um, imagine in your mind's eye the NHS logo it's a it's it's a blue square with an italic NHS inside it and the uh, WH Smith in their wisdom had chosen an italic blue square and put a straight NHS inside it of course, the letters are almost the same. It's everyone got very, very upset about this. Uh, I'm suggesting it was a terrible, terrible design, which, to be clear, it is. <laughs> There's no doubt about this. WH Smith is, you know, the, the beauty of WH Smith branding is that it's in a serif, right? It, it's distinguished from Subway sandwiches. Uh, but the, the interesting thing about about the about this conversation is that no one talks about how brilliant. The NHS logo is, and it truly is one of the greatest brand marks ever, in my view, because of two things. First of all, the colour is incredibly reassuring. It's dark blue. And colour theory is, you know, you can't really kind of work around it, really. Why do so many software companies like using blue? That's because blue is code for security, stability, it's not going to fail in any way. It's also not exciting. And so yeah, there's everything sort of good about that if you're a software company or possibly even a bank. And so with the NHS, you know, that's clearly what you want in a national health service. But inside that, the type is possibly the most dynamic typographical position that you could invent. They're in big shouty caps. They're slightly compressed they're really heavy and also they're italics i mean it's the absolute kind of perfect description of performance typography and so they've managed to blend you know, this incredibly dynamic typographical gesture with this incredibly reassuring color palette so imagine it but imagine in your mind's eye if the nhs logo were red and the type were to remain exactly the same we would be really unsettled this would not be suitable or fit for purpose in any way whatsoever. In fact, it would look like the Sun newspaper. This is not what we want or need. And so the, the genius of the NHS logo, I suppose, is it proves to me that, that colour will modify typography. Because colour works on a deep, emotional, instinctive level before we even think. It frames our point of reference. And so... This was the, the difficulty with the with, with the WHS logo is that they italicized the color. It was bonkers. But fair play to them for trying it out. And you know, in terms of column inches, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you mentioned there about design language, right? So uh the idea of kind of creating a bit of a design language for for your brand. Tell, tell me a bit more about what would be a good way of developing a design, a design language from an aesthetics point of view, from a uh, you know, brand identity consistency point of view. What are the key elements here? The basic building blocks of, of your brand language are, in the first instance, the typefaces that you choose to represent the words that you place wherever you put them. You know, it's 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 a raw material. Um, in my younger days, I used to claim there are only two typefaces in the world: plain or fancy. Which one do you want? Uh, in actual fact, there are three. In my view, there's sand, serif, and slab, and they each mean three different um, uh, brand postures, if you like. And you, this is represented, for example, by by um, motor car brands. So, sands, performance, BMW, serif, superiority, Mercedes Benz, slab, safety, Volvo. This is it's very reductive, obviously, um, but in the first instance, you've got to make some decisions about about your your brand point of view you, you need to understand what your values are and how you want to see those represented now of course you know you can you will then start layering uh a whole series of um of, 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 of design considerations so that you can actually represent all 
aspects of your brand, if you like, because because nobody is, is that one dimensional. But that sort of consistency of purpose, that sort of um, that sort of focus really matters. So you need, so it's it's all about your, your your brand values. What sort of posture do you want to inhabit? You know, the New Yorker is set in serif. It's a superior brand. It just is. You know, or you would it would be absurd if it was set in sands. So so this matters. This 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 sort of basic DNA. After that, color goes without saying. And then there's all the things which change a lot. I mean, these are that, color and color and font. These are fixtures and fittings. Then there's the things that change. So there's art. So photographs, illustrations, iconography, video, uh, uh, podcasting, tone of voice, whatever. All that stuff goes through the pipes. So in the first instance, you've got to build the pipe. Make sure the pipe is in the right place. <laughs> Many brands, they build the pipe over here. and it Well, it should be over there. So... Those are, I, I think, the, the two most important considerations. After that, then there's uh, furniture, if I could call it that. So, you know, the way in which, you know, IDEO might kind of organize those sort of angled shapes on their mobile phone. I saw this a little while ago and was like entranced by, you know, how they managed to persuade their developers to do that. <laughs> it was remarkable. You know, Rolling Stone, for what it's worth, is, is the foundation of Rolling Stone is an Oxford rule. Right, and an Ox rule for those who don't know is two rules adjacent: one fat, one thin. The the, the conceit uh, of Rolling Stone is that because it's all about preserving, you know, the uh, a, a fixed moment in time, if you like, is that the edge of the page, and then there's that they put a box rule around the content on the page, and the Oxford rule is a double conceit because they put a rule around the rule. So it's just like, how many rules do we need here? Uh, but that double rule is built into their logo it's part it's a fundamental part of their dna the brand dna it actually isn't anything but this double rule it's because and when you back in the day i don't know if they still have it but rolling stone used to have a uh, one of pete townsend's guitars uh, which he'd smashed up on stage and he was hung in the um uh, in the reception but it was all sort of uh, uh solidified in a huge block of resin like a fixed moment in time. <laughs> this is completely aligned with the, the what the Oxford rule does. So these, these kind of uh, tiny details, you know, you can build empires off the back of them. And and so I'd love to bring this back because we have uh, obviously have a lot of planners, strategists, marketers uh, who um, in the audience of fast starters who will obviously have to uh, are in the business of presenting ideas and, and persuading stakeholders or, or even customers, of course, to to kind of behave or, or agree to things or whatever. So uh, this idea of how you present ideas in a visual way to persuade. Um, if you were to distill down one or two pieces of advice for how a planner, strategist, marketer can present ideas in a way that will persuade uh, an audience, what would those one or two pieces of advice be? So when you say uh, persuade, in what in what context? Are you talking about uh, in a pitch deck or are you talking about uh, in an ongoing stream of content? Because you've got to tailor the message to the the, the the way which you're going to be telling it yeah no that's a good question so so let's say it's it's a presentation so it could be a pitch deck or you're putting together a business case or something like that to persuade uh somebody else an audience uh, so let's keep it to that if it's a presentation and so well actually let's say let, let's say it's it's a deck in which you're not going to be in the room so it's like a brochure, if you like, because in the presentation you're in the room, and so therefore you can modify. You know, the the deck is a, like a, an accompaniment, if you like. You know, you're the solo singer, uh, and there's someone over there on a cello. Whereas if it's a piece of recorded music, then obviously it's got to work as a complete story in its own right. Um, it's like all things. It's just like keep people engaged. One thing leads to another thing, and so you know there are, um, I think. Uh, some fairly you know well recognized kind of 
approaches to this, which is in the first instance, and in the last instance, and every other instance, you need to hold your customer in mind all the time. It's not about you. It is really not about you. They need to be persuaded that you can keep the promises you make. And so therefore your creds are important. But those creds, if you've done your job well, will be seeded out in the world because you're going to be talking about your business all the time, or you should be. It's a bit because our authority and our expertise about the things that you know we we love to do and that or that we're good at um, uh, is the is the ground bait, if you like. If you go fishing, right? You're not just going to rock up with a rod and a line. You're going to take some ground bait and you're going to tip all the ground bait in the river, and then the fish are going to come there, and then you're going to throw in the hook. Uh, and so that might be you know one's approach to content marketing for want of a better word so in the first instance you you absolutely have to let people understand what's in it for them what am i going to get out of this why am i here uh and it's so you've it's it's got to be you know this, this is this is business isn't it it's like selling people something that they really need they can't get from anyone else so your branding job is to persuade well they can't go to anyone else and then you've got to tell them well, what is it that they really need and so you've got to get it to the point where we're not trying to sell people on the basis of price or anything like that. You're trying to sell to people on the basis that they completely understand that you are the only person who can solve this particular problem. Like if you want to go and see a specialist doctor, you know, you don't start quibbling about the price. If you've got a heart condition, it's just like, well, are you are, are you the doctor who can fix this problem? In which case, let's go. So, but all of those cons have to be um, organized in a way and so people understand them effortlessly and with in, in, in less than, a, you know, three seconds or maybe even quicker than that. You know, it, it, it needs to be sort of in, intuitive, if you like, which means that the, the work on, you know, your brand strategy, uh, your intentions, your values really do matter because that's the thing that makes you distinct from other businesses. And that's how you position yourself so that you become the obvious choice. So, you know, positioning is, you know, it really, 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 really does matter. And um, if you've got really strong positioning, then you can execute off that. Otherwise, no one has any idea, well, what does good look like? Well, what does good look like? You know, it's um, if you're operating in a vacuum where you don't understand who's holding the other end of the rope, it's impossible to tell. Should he be pink? Should he be blue? I don't know. Let's ask what the chairman's niece thinks. Yeah, that's that's amazing. And Andy, it's been absolutely fascinating. I'm sure, unfortunately, we've run out of time. I could talk to you all day. But um, thank you so much for being a part of uh, Firestarters and uh, for such uh, wise words there. And uh, if you enjoyed this uh, episode, of course, don't forget to subscribe and also to share. But um, my thanks to to Andy Cowles for uh, such brilliant insights and for being part of Fast Starters. Thank you very much, Andy. Well, thank you, Neil. It's, uh, as I say, it's uh, it's an honour to be on the show. Delighted. <laughs>